Sure. My name is Neil Katyal, and I'm a uh, law partner at Hogan Levels, where I co-direct our appellate practice, and I'm also a law professor at Georgetown. Sure. I grew up in Chicago. Uh, my parents came from India, and uh, I was born a year after they got married. Uh, they got married in India, and then they moved to the United States and uh, grew up there. Uh, like many uh, Indian Americans, I was told there was only one profession, or possibly two, uh, to be a doctor uh, or perhaps a physician. Uh, and uh, I um, really internalized that. And I remember being in high school and someone asked me, what am I going to be? And they said, a doctor. And, they said, and I said, they said, why? And I said, well, you know, you can do a lot of good for the world. And I remember the person saying, well, you can do good in other professions like pro bono uh, work. And I said, what's pro bono? I had no idea. Um, uh, at the same time in high school, uh, I joined the debate team. I was a shy kid um, and interested in science, but somehow uh, got uh, into that. And that really changed my life. And um, from the time I was a sophomore in high school through uh, my senior year in college, I was flying around the country and debating uh, against other people, researching all the time back at home, and then going and using that research uh, in arguments over the weekend uh, across the country. And indeed, one of my big arch rivals was a guy named Tom Goldstein uh, in high school. And there have been many others in high school and college, uh, Lisa Blatt and other people who uh, I come across with a lot of frequency uh, today. So anyway, so I did that. I went to Dartmouth College where I debated uh, and then to Yale Law School. And I graduated from law school. Um, I applied to clerk uh, and, uh, and clerked first for Judge Guido Calabresi, uh, who was our dean at the Yale Law School um, uh, and had just been appointed to the Second Circuit and then was lucky enough to get a clerkship with Justice Breyer uh, after that on the Supreme Court. Um, during my clerkship on the Supreme Court, I also went on the teaching market because teaching has been kind of the passion of my life. Uh, and I got a job at Georgetown while I was clerking and thought I was going to do that. And um, uh, lo and behold, uh, you know, all these kind of things are always random, but I had worked for Al Gore's office one summer. He was the vice president, and his counsel called me up and said, We're going to nominate someone to be the deputy attorney general. And I think you'll really like this person, and maybe would you like to work for him? And I said, what's the deputy attorney general? I had no idea what the deputy attorney general was. Um, they said, it's a guy named Eric Holder. He'll be the number two person at the department. And so I met him and uh, uh, agreed to work for him. So I built in a two-year leave to joining the faculty at Georgetown uh, in order to go to the Justice Department. And you know, I thought at the time that was a really good idea. I hadn't ever practiced law in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I've always thought it's important that uh, people, uh, the students in law schools, have uh, at least some professors who've had some real world experience. And so, so I did that. And I thought I would be doing kind of appellate kind of, you know, kind of complicated issues of law. Well, you know, it turned out that, uh, you know, it was a hodgepodge of things, but more than anything, it was two things, the, uh, the national security side um, and as well the Independent Counsel Act. This was a time when the Monica Lewinsky and Whitewater investigations were ongoing and uh, Ms. Reno had asked me to look into should the Independent Counsel Act be killed as a policy matter. And so I spent a couple years on that. Um, and a lot of time on national security work. And I got the national security bug. And that's what I love to do. And I remember leaving when I left the Justice Department. I said to myself, the only job I want in law again is to go and be like a national security advisor or something like that. That that was really, to me, the end all and be all. I had no thought whatsoever about being an appellate litigator at that time. It was the national security policy work that was so fascinating and interesting to me. And in general, it was a pretty um, closed set of people who worked on those matters. And it was an opportunity there to, uh, to, to come in and, and to do some good. Well, I mean, the thing about national security law, and I had taken a course from John Hart Ely in, uh, in law school. Uh, he was visiting at Yale that year about national security in the law. And the, the, it's, it's wonderful because you've got really institutional constraints. The courts aren't very good at making law in this area for, for, I think, appropriate reasons. They don't have intelligence backgrounds and briefings and the like. Um, but you have this whole tradition of internal executive branch 
uh, rulemaking on how they're going to approach really difficult questions. I mean, for us, we had um, you know uh, India and Pakistan detonated nuclear weapons. How those sanctions were going to be adopted. We had Pol Pot um, alive and um, possibly able to be captured, and what kind of trial we'd bring for him. We had uh, the horrific attacks by Bin Laden. On our uh, on our embassies in Africa and the response to that, um, we had all sorts of uh, all sorts of really difficult intelligence questions uh, that came through. And it, you know, to be the national security advisor at the Justice Department at that time, which I was, was a really phenomenal uh, set of experiences. Um, and and I just loved it so much. Uh, the thought that I would do anything in the appellate realm. Was uh, was not really uh, possible. So, so I, when I came to the Justice Department, I didn't have a national security background except for one course taught by John Hart Ely. Um, but that just happened to be the opening at the time that they needed someone for. And um, you know, I worked a day and night um, to make myself uh, not just available, but good and value added. Um, so that's what I did. And then things changed. I left the Justice Department uh, in November of 2000, uh, just a little bit after I left. Uh, we had a difficult presidential election that was deeply contested. Uh, some of the vice president's uh, folks asked me to be part of that team. And for 36 days and nights, uh, I disappeared from the face of the earth uh, while I worked um, really with a team of students um, on that litigation. Um, and that was really my foray back into the world of appellate advocacy. Uh, from there, um, uh, you know, it was obviously a tough thing to work for Vice President Gore during that. Um, and after that, I wasn't sure that appellate law was really my thing. Um, uh, and then we had the just the tragedy of 9/11, and. I remember after 9-11, uh, you know, I was teaching uh, constitutional law that year, I was teaching it at Yale, and I, my students were always teasing me that I was so deferentialist to the executive branch and that I generally can't, uh, I, would, I wouldn't think anything the president does is unconstitutional, particularly in the national security realm. And I remember um, that I came into class around November 15th, 2001 and said, you know, you all are always uh, saying that I'm just such a deferentialist to the executive, but here's something that's really blatantly unconstitutional. Um, it's a uh, order by President Bush to set up these military trials at Guantanamo uh, where he would set up all of the trials, he'd write all the rules, he'd handpick the defendants, he'd handpick the prosecutors, he'd handpick the defense counsel, he was going to handpick the appellate judges, he was going to define the punishments, which he said included the death penalty. He was going to write all the criminal procedure rules for the trial. And then, by the way, the last lines of his order said, the federal courts have no business reviewing what I'm doing on habeas corpus review. Uh, well, I thought that went too far. And I wound up testifying in the Senate a couple weeks later on, on November 28, 2001, about that. Uh, and then ultimately, Larry Tribe testified a few weeks later, who I know has also been on this uh, interview series. And we decided to do what law professors do, which is write a law review article as fast as we can about why President Bush, what he was doing, was unconstitutional. So we rushed that to print in the Yale Law Journal. And uh, we thought that we were told that you know, these trials were going to happen imminently. Well, we waited and waited. Nothing happened. Nothing happened really for about two years when they finally got around to appointing a defense counsel. And I reached out to that defense counsel and said, you know, here's my article. I really do think that these are problematic. Um, and at the time, I, we had just had our first, uh, you know, ch child recently, and uh, on our way to our second. Um, you know, I wasn't really sure. I wanted to go and throw my hat into the litigation ring, particularly into something that was this. Um, Controversial and, and difficult, and there were you know respectable people on both sides who had very strong feelings about it. But I also thought to myself that I remembered my days in the Clinton administration and the national security realm, and who does that work? It's really a small subset of people. And for me, I taught constitutional law, and I did national security background, and I had a strong reputation at that time of being you know, a moderate and a hawk against bin Laden and so on. And I thought to myself, you know, if I don't step up and do this, you know, I'm not really sure who else uh, would um, uh, that could make the credible case here. I mean, certainly there'll be any number of interest groups that would. But for me, 
this wasn't ever a matter of ideology. This was a matter of kind of centrist, obvious constitutional principles, um, and that I didn't think politics or um, or the agendas of various groups should get in the way of the court just seeing what this was, which was a real blatant power grab by the president. So I reached out to uh, the defense counsel, and we ultimately created a test case. Um, we filed it in the district court, and uh, that case ultimately became Hamdan versus Rumsfeld, which was my very first Supreme Court argument. 